Thank you for introducing me. Um, my name is Gong Chen. I'm from Nanjing University. And uh, in this talk, I will talk about something about summarizing semantic data. <laughs> so firstly, I would briefly introduce Nanjing. It's a very beautiful city, and it's actually the second largest city in eastern China. It's just second to Shanghai, actually. And um, it's also the capital of the Jiangsu province. Um, there are many universities in, in, in Nanjing. And, you know, Nanjing actually has the highest ratio of uh, college students to uh, total population in China. Uh, there are 10 or maybe 20 universities in, in this very large city. And if you have plans to visit China, don't miss Nanjing. Sure. You're north of Shanghai. Ah, sorry? You're north of Shanghai. Uh, it's uh, west. West, west of Shanghai. To the west it's of inside. Shanghai. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then university was founded in 1902, and now it has three campuses, and more than 32,000 students. And uh, it's one of the top ranked universities in China, and also a very good university in Asia. So I come from the Web Software Research Group. The group, uh, uh, the leader is Professor Yu Zhongqu, and uh, it's it's kind of a small group in our university, so we have only three faculty members, uh, Dr. Wei Hu and myself. We have done, we, we have actually been focusing on semantic web research in the past 10 years. Um, we have done something about semantic web data integration like ontology matching or uh, entity coreference resolution. And we have developed a, a tool called Falcon AO, which is an ontology matching system. And I have, we have also done something on um, semantic web search. We developed a search engine called Falcons, uh, which is, is still working, actually. Uh, but we, we just have no time to keep it updated. Uh, recently, we developed a semantic web browser called SV. And now we have uh, slightly changed our focus from semantic web research to the use of semantic web technology. Um, recently, we are working on a very large project in China that, is, that involves almost all the top-level universities in China that try to develop a, a system that can um, pass uh, China's, entrance, China's university's entrance examination called Gaokao. So we are act actively working on question answering and problem solving just to, to, you know, to have the computer pass the challenge. And we were still working on knowledge engineering and data fusion. And myself is still working on semantic search and data summarization. So in this talk, I will focus on summarizing semantic data. Uh, I guess many of you guys here are familiar with semantic data. So I just go quickly through the introductory uh, section. Semantic data is just um, uh, another name for semantic data is knowledge graphs. Um, defined by Google. Um, so basically, the data is graph structure, and the nodes represent entities or entity types called classes. And the edges represent uh, properties, which can be attributes of an entity, like date of birth, or, or, or gender, uh, or, or name. And uh, properties can also, the arcs can also be relations that connect entities, such as uh, nodes, uh, like Bob, nodes, Alice, or or uh, interests, or whatever relation that can exist in the real world. So that is semantic data, because you know such labels, labels on the nodes and the arcs actually they have meanings, right? They are not just symbols; they have meanings. So that's why we call it semantic data. And such meanings are <coughs> are supposed to be processable by by the computer. Everybody can publish semantic data on the web, so. The data come from different websites, uh, and we call them different data sets. So in this example, this graph actually comes from two data sets. But they, they use the same identifier for entities and classes, so that uh, all the data on the web actually form a giant, big, uh, semantic graph. Here is a snapshot of the data sets two years ago, maybe. Um, to a recent, uh, to some recent uh, statistics, there are, there have been already half a million of datasets 
of semantic data sets on the web that can be freely used. So, so you can reuse, you can find the data you need. So one of the largest, uh, two of the large bubbles there, very early uh, came from here. Uh, there was something called noisy semantic sensor. Ah, yeah. Uh, so our first you know, about uh, sensor observation data set came mm -hmm. from here, and there's mm -hmm. something else I forget now. Mm -hmm. That's cool. So we have a lot of data. That's why we need data summarization. I will show you three uh, application scenarios of this technique. First is, you probably are familiar with such a page. It's from Google. Google search, and if you enter a keyword Kiri like and Mona Lisa, you will see on the right hand side of this picture, uh, here is what Google call, call it, uh, Google calls it a knowledge card, um, or just knowledge graph. So, uh, no, this they call it info box, right? Info box, yeah, yeah. And yeah. yeah. you see some, one, two, three, four, six properties of this entry, yeah. Mona Lisa, right? Actually, Mona Lisa has hundreds of properties as it's as the dis description of this entry, but Google only shows six of them. Why? Because yes, it's a, the space is limited, right? We, we don't have too much room to show all the properties, so we need a summary of that. We can only show the most important properties of this entity. That's what we call entity summarization, or how to summarize, how to automatically summarize the description, description of an entity. Here's one example. And the second application scenario of summarization techniques is when we, uh, when we are given a, a large graph that describes relations between entities, we, are, we, may be, we, are, we may be interested in the associations between entities. So in this example, this graph describes some papers and conferences and researchers. <coughs> so, it's not, not just a toy example, okay? But uh, you know, in practice, such a graph can be very large, like including millions of nodes. Um, so if we are interested in what are the associations or relationships between Alice and Bob, how can we answer that? How can a system answer that? We, we can't just return such a graph because it contains too much information for users, right? So we need to identify some important associations from such a very large graph. That's what we call summarizing the associations between entities. That's a second application scenario of this technique. The third is... So select some parts from through that? Yeah, that's one kind of summarizing. Yeah. So it's called a kind of graph summarization. Yeah, you, part of, you summarize part of the graph. Both node, uh, I mean, in this scenario, only relations summarize? Or also not also uh, in this case, only summarize the relations. Okay. Yeah. And third application scenario is, uh, as we have seen, we have a lot of data sets on the web. And you know, we have half a million of data sets. And if we have an information need, we need to find out which data set is the one that we are looking for. But it's, it's difficult to find out because there are too many data sets. So, Fortunately, we have seen some open data portals that have been developed that we can use, such as the European Open Data Portal or New York City Open Data Portal. Here is a snapshot of a search results page returned by European Open Data Portal. Uh, if we enter the keyword Curie Health, we will see like more than 500 data sets about this keyword. And here are some data sets returned uh, you can see the title and the short description of this data set. But can we, can we find out which data set is the one that we are really interested in? Only based on the title and short, short descriptions? Maybe not. Because all of them are just metadata, right? We, we, we don't have a chance to see the data itself. We only see some metadata. So, but you know, when we, when we use Google or some other web search engines, what do we see on the search results page are not just metadata. We see data, we see snippets, right? Snippets of web pages. So similarly, I think here in, in this case, we need some summaries of the data sets to show the contents of the data set instead of, uh, in, uh, in addition to the metadata, right? So that's a third application scenario. So that's why we need summarization technologies to automatically generate a summary for a large amount of data. That is available on the web. So before getting into details, I'd like to um, 
discuss two types of summaries. First is called extractive methods. That means uh, if we look at uh, we look at the, the data as a set, extractive methods try to extract the subset of data as a summary. So, for instance, if we have a, a large graph, we can extract a subgraph from that graph as a summary. That's extractive method. So the key techniques in this line of work is to do ranking, right? Ranking is a key technique to extract the methods. Uh, the other line of work is called abstractive methods. So it's also called, also known as non-extract methods because uh, the idea is that they, they define a summary as a high-level abstraction of data. So you know the. Then the summarization is uh, it, it will become a more complex process because we, we can't just use ranking, right? We need some higher level abstraction. We need some different forms of data. So that's two types of uh, two styles of research in this field. Okay. So, so next I will just briefly uh, review some uh, recent advances in the data summarization field and uh, based on different tasks or different application scenarios that they try to try to meet. And also I will particularly focus on some of our recent work. First is summarize, summarizing entry descriptions. Here is an example of description of an entry, Leonardo. And we show several properties of this entry. You know, in practice, such a, a table can be very long because Leonardo already has three or four hundred uh, property value pairs that describe this entity. So for extractive methods, basically we just try to we aim to extract the subset of property value pairs from the description of this entity. That's extractive methods for entity summarization. And um, but to my knowledge, all the known methods are extractive methods for entity summarization. I haven't seen any abstract method for entity summarization. If you know some, let me know that. Okay. So, so um, just a little uh, mm -hmm. clarification. There may be something a little bit in between the two. Mm -hmm. uh, you showed the Google info box, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this concept is not new. Um, yeah. In uh, 1999, I have started a company, a semantic web company. Mm -hmm. Or Tali, and, uh, and mm -hmm. then we filed for a patent in 2000, award in 2001, mm -hmm. uh, where we created uh, for your semantic search term, mm -hmm. we'll create a uh, what we, we call, used to call rich media reference box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and the uh, in that particular context, um, we'll take uh, parts of the thing. So it is primarily extractive, as you call it, but um, any of the things can be semantically enriched. So mm -hmm. it does. It doesn't have to be what is already in the data, but it can be a metadata from some additional source of the information. Yeah. Suppose you look at a stock, it's possible that you can get from a web service for the stock whether you know the stock is up now and by how much compared to the last close. Mm -hmm. So it may be uh, a more of a derivative data, uh, more of a, you know enriched data, metadata compared to simply a faithful uh, sub, um, subset of the existing data. Yeah. And in our case, uh, the data that this body, you know, reference uh, page did not come from necessarily just one source. It did not come from, it came a combination, it, it came from a combination of knowledge graph, mm -hmm. we used to call world model, mm -hmm. and ontology, with the two mm -hmm. terms we use, mm -hmm. both are using the patent. Mm -hmm. um, and, or it will come from, uh, so it will come from knowledge base or it will come from data. Higher. I mean, come in the first top, top ranking, so I mean, I mean, get it higher priorities. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I'd like to show later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, in the literature, there have been, there actually have been 
I don't know, maybe dozens of papers on entry summarization, but if you look at the details, they are basically the same. Uh, they use quite similar ideas on the intrinsic, on the metrics used for ranking. So, so I categorize all the papers into four categories. They basically use four, ki four kinds of metrics. <coughs> First is frequency. So the idea is straightforward, right? If a property occurs very often, in the data set, then that, that property might be important. Uh, that's frequency. The second is uh, uh, centrality. Centrality is similar to frequency, but it's, um, it is believed to be more effective than, than frequency because, uh, uh, you know, um, an entity as the value of a property, um, it may not occur frequently in the data set, but it may be referred to from a very important, from another important entity. So that, that entity, that uh, entity may still be important because it is uh, referred to from an important one. So uh, we can measure such kind of importance by using centrality measures like page rank or whatever you, you prefer. Um, to as a substitute for frequency because centrality is believed to be more stable than frequency. That's the second type of uh, metric that have been used in, in the literature to rank property value, to rank property values. So we can just you know try to measure the, the centrality of uh, the property values. Uh, here is a work that we did five years ago. Uh, our early work on entity summarization, we try to directly calculate the centrality of a property value pair. How can we do that? We represent each property value pair as a node in a graph, and then we define um, a pair of inverse arcs between every pair of nodes. And we give some weights to these arcs. Uh, the weight is defined by the inverse Google distance. So it's kind of similarity or relatedness between these two property value pairs. And on this graph, we run page rank. We run, actually, we run weighted page rank. So, you know, it's actually a similarity graph, and we run a page rank on this similarity graph. We can find out which property value pair is central to the data. I mean, in terms of uh, uh, topics because the similarity is measured by based on Google distance. So that's one way to directly measure the centrality of a property value pair. Uh, but unfortunately, in our later experiments, we found that this strategy does not work quite well, to be honest. So, so, so in our recent systems, we, we never use that again. The fourth uh, metric is called informative. It, is, it has been widely used today. And Almost every summarization approach will use this, this metric because it's, it is really very effective. The idea is quite simple. So if we have two candidate property value pairs, one, is t one says that uh, this entity is a person and the other says that this entity is an artist, which one do you prefer? I think type artist is more important because it carries more information than type person. Right? If, if we know that someone is an artist, we, we know that she is also a person, right? Um, so the problem is how, how can we measure the, the, the amount of information that is carried by a property value pair? We can borrow some ideas from information theory. We can measure the self-information uh, of a property value pair. That is, the, the basic idea is, is that if a property value pair has been used frequently to describe some entities in the data set, then this property value pair carries very little information. That's a basic idea. Uh, so some really seen property value pairs are believed to be more informative, and they, are, they will be given priority in summarization. Finally, uh, you know, a uh, summary is limited by, by the space that it can use to show. Uh, so we want to show some diverse information. We don't want to show redundant information in a size-limited summary. Um, so to diversify summary, uh, we will try to avoid 
introducing property value pairs that share common properties because such property value pairs may describe the same or closely related aspects of any entity. And because we want to, since we want to diversify uh, a summary, we, we may try to avoid such property value pairs that share a common property. So that, yeah. that means basically these two properties are created, you are going to select only one of them. Uh, it depends. Uh, you know, if so we use some simple uh, heuristic, we could just choose choose one of them. Uh, but uh, there are some other ways to. Uh, I will show later that we can. Uh, we have some better ways to determine when we, we should choose choose one and, and when we should choose two or more. Um, but as a simple strategy, yes, we can just choose one to to fully diversify a summary. We can also, you know, uh, use some more sophisticated metrics for for computing the similarity between two property value pairs in order to diversify a summary. Uh, in our recent work last year, uh, we tried to compute some string similarity between property value pairs and also some semantic similarity based on uh, reasoning engine. So, for instance, uh, by reasoning, we can know that uh, if we know type. Uh, so some entities has a type artist, we will know that it, it is also a person. So this can be done by a standard reasoning engine. So if we can do such inference, we will say that mm, these two property value pairs are redundant. So we will show at most one of them to diversify a summary. That's diversity. So all the above metrics are intrinsic metrics. What are intrinsic metrics? The interesting metrics are metrics that only use the data itself. They are, as you have seen, they are only based on the data graph, right? We didn't use any external resources. There are also some extrinsic metrics that try to use some external resources. Let's see two examples. First is context based. Sometimes uh, we can use a context to generate a summary. So for instance, in this entity search engine, if we want to show a snippet for this entity, which is returned as a search result for this keyword query, um, you know, we can only show like 10 or, or even five property value pairs as a snippet of this entity. So we, we are actually doing entity summarization here, right? And in this case, because we have a keyword query available, so we can, we, we, maybe we, we want to select property value pairs that are relevant to this keyword query. That is, the property value pairs that contain some query keywords. So here, so this is a typical example of using the context in summarization. Another example is in our last year's paper. Uh, it's about the relevance uh, to not a query, but a document. So imagine that we are reading a document, okay? We are reading a document about Starry Light and some other patents. And uh, maybe some of, some of you have used some, some apps that can, can show you a pop-up that will provide some additional information about the entity that occurs, that appears in the document. So, for instance, if, if uh, such, such apps identify that here is an entity, then, uh, then uh, it will show a pop-up. So you can click on that entity and you will see a pop-up uh, containing some uh, uh, dis description of this entity in case you want to know more about this entity. And when we, in this application, um, you know, it's just a pop-up, so we don't have too much room to show too much information, so we need a summary there. And uh, this summary can, can be biased towards the context, I mean, the, be biased towards this document. So for instance, uh, when we try to generate a summary for Leonardo here, and we know from the context that this document describes Starry Night, which is a famous painting. Painting is the type of this entity, right? And then when we generate a summary for Leonardo, we can also try to choose some property value pairs that also describe patents, like Leonardo Chris Mona Lisa, because that matches the context. So such a, 
property value pair might be more interesting to, to the readers that are reading this document about papers. So that's the basic idea. It's a, another example of a context-based summarization. The third example is uh, what we call it co-summarization. In some cases, we, we want to summarize not one single entity, but two or more entities at the same time. Uh, here is an example. I guess many of you are familiar with the entity linking. So we have a document, and there are some mentions, some entity mentions that can be linked to from entities in your knowledge base. That is called entity linking. Um, Usually, entity linking is done by a computer, by a, by some algorithm. But sometimes, it might be difficult for for a computer to do entity linking, and it, the computer might need help from from human experts. So in that case which we call it interactive entity linking. Um, here, here is an, an example. Uh, the computer has found that, okay, iPhone 6 corresponds to this entity in the knowledge base, and Samsung is also linked to an entity in the knowledge base. But when the computer faces uh, Apple, maybe this word is too ambiguous, so the computer does not know whether it means uh, a fruit or it means an, an IT company then the computer may ask for help from human experts. So when, the, when the human expert is trying to offer help, the expert will see to, to will see these two candidate answers that can be linked to in the knowledge base, right? One is IT company and the other is fruit. So how, let's just try to figure out how this expert, this human expert will help. Um, in order to make a decision, human expert will try to, so, so the expert needs to firstly know what are these two entities, right? Uh, the expert needs to read their descriptions in the knowledge base in order to know, okay, this is a company, this is a fruit, so this document is about uh, IT stuff, so we should link Apple to this IT company Apple, not the fruit Apple. But this description of the entities, of these candidate entities are very long. So in order to to, to help uh, the human expert, human expert make a decision quickly, we can show summaries there, right? We can show summaries for these candidate entities to help the users make a decision more quickly. Uh, and that's uh, what we call co-summarization, because we, we actually want to summarize the descriptions, descriptions of two entities at the same time, not just one single entity. And in this case, in the summaries, we can show some similarity between two entities and also some differences between entities. So for example, some different values of the same property in order to help users more quickly make a decision. That's uh, code summarization. Um, it's not an application scenario. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, actually, once the text contains multiple entities, how do you pair <coughs> entities? To, to what? Pal, pal? How do you pair couple entities for co-summarization? Uh, oh. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's not. It's actually not about pairing. Uh, when I say co-summarization, I mean uh, there are two or more candidate entities that can be linked to from an entity dimension. Oh, you mean for a single entity once it has uh, a single entity dimension okay. can be can be linked to some one of the candidates, and so we want to generate a summary for this candidate entities. That's co summary. So, so, so in this case, uh, in this summary, we, so the summary is expected to show the difference between candidates in order to help an uh, expert make a decision, right? Yeah, because uh, intuitively the other way is uh, making summarization according to the context means the neighboring uh, entities or text. Yeah, 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 just another way of doing that, yeah. maybe, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, and there are also some metrics that try to use some external knowledge, uh, I don't want to go into detail here, but uh, you can use domain knowledge, you can use search entities, you can use user feedback, and whatever data you have to improve uh, your summarization approach. So we have seen many metrics, and if you look at the papers in the literature, they combine different metrics in different ways. For instance, here is a, uh, one of the simplest uh, strategies. We just use 
each metric individual to, to rank the property value pairs individually and when we combine the top ranked ones into a summary. That's a very simple strategy. We can also give priority to different um, metrics. For, for example, we can firstly rank property value pairs by the frequency of properties, then we break ties by the frequency of property values. So on and so forth. Um, a natural way of combin combining metrics is to rank property value pairs by an arithmetic combination. We can use some weights to add some soft priorities to different metrics. And here's my favorite, to do it using combinatorial optimization. I will briefly show you how to do that. Uh, Actually, we can model the problem of uh, entry summarization as a combinatorial optimization problem, such as a quadratic NAPSAP or quadratic multidimensional NAPSAP problem. Uh, you, could, you can find your own uh, favorites of uh, variants of different you know, combinatorial optimization problems. Here is an example. When we do co summarization, okay? in the case of co summarization, I guess you, you are familiar with knapsack problem, the standard knapsack problem, right? You, you, you have a knapsack, uh, we have some items that can be added to knapsack, and but we can't exceed the, the capacity of knapsack. In the meantime, we want to maximize the profits of the items that can, can be added to knapsack. That's a standard binary knapsack problem. And what we use in this work is a quadratic knapsack problem. That means the profit function is a quadratic function. So we actually have a profit matrix. That is, if we choose, if we add an item to a knapsack, uh, we, we, we of course have some profits, right? We gain some profits, but if we add two particular items to a knapsack, we will, we will gain some additional profit. That's why profit function is a quadratic function, because it's about item, both item I and item J, okay? And we can use this problem to formulate the entity summarization or actually co summarization because we can use the diagonal to represent the informativeness of a property value pair. And we can use the other cells in this matrix to represent, for instance, uh, diversity issues or, or uh, um, some, some uh, similarity or differences issues. For example, if we are if we are considering two property value pairs that come from the description of one single entity uh, that is uh, in this part and this part so we have two entities here is the first entity the second entity so so sale here means that uh, we are caring about the profit so, so what are the x-axis what are the y-axis for that uh, uh, if there are if there are m property value pairs in one entity and n property value pairs in the other entity, then that will be a, a m plus n square matrix. So, so here means uh, the property value pairs, the dimensions means the property value pairs in the first entity and the property value pairs in the second entity. So, so this part means the profit that we can gain uh, by selecting property value pairs from the same entity. And this part means the, the, the profit that we can gain by selecting property value pairs from two different entities in code summarization. So we can use this part to indicate the differences between two entities, such as uh, in order to be used in, in, in interactive entity linking I think just introduced. And for this part, we can define the, the profit as the inverse similarity between two property value pairs from the same entity. So if we choose a lot of uh, highly similar property value pairs from the same entity, then the profit will be reduced because we, it's defined as inverse similarity. So in this way, we can you know, improve the diversity of a summary. That's one example of using combinatorial optimization to formulate the entity summarization. You can find some details in our recent papers. We can, of, of course, also use machine learning or some other ways to combine metrics. I don't want to go into details. Okay, so that's about the entity summarization. Now let's move to how to summarize associations between entities. 
Fortunately, in this field, we have seen both extractive and abstractive methods. So first, let's go to uh, extractive method. <coughs> We're given graph and two entries, Bob and Alice. We want to know what are the associations between them. There are a lot of associations, like paths, connect them. We are interested in what are the most important associations between these two entities. So firstly, we need to, you know, before summarization, we, we firstly need to find out what are the paths that connect two entities, right? We need to firstly find the paths, then rank the paths. So to find the paths, find all the paths that connect two entities, we can use bidirectional BFS. Uh, the idea is basically to start a BFS from each, so start one BFS from each entry and we try to meet in the middle in order to optimize the performance of uh, graph search. That's path finding and using bidirectional BFS we can efficiently, relatively efficiently find a lot of paths that connect two entities. Are you aware of the work on semantic associations? Sorry? Are you aware of the work on semantic association? Yeah, yeah, from, from your previous paper, I've read a lot, actually. Came up for, yeah, came yeah, up for, yeah, yeah, yeah. well, well, okay. Yeah, I actually just borrowed the terms from, from that paper. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, actually, pathfinding is a very slow process. Yes, yeah, exactly. Um, that's why I will later introduce a way to optimize the performance. You know, upcoming work. Uh, yeah, and, and anybody who wants to work on path knows that uh, it's a you know high complexity job, so there is uh, a good bit of effort on people trying to do that. So it's a, you know, like it's, it's, a, it's a work that has been explored. I, I can't tell you that it cannot be explored further, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of work being in that done in that. So just I think we can't give up just saying that it's a difficult job. There's a lot more. No, I know. That. We, we actually we, we did some index and we we actually tried to achieve a trade-off between time for computing and the space for materializing the results. I will, uh, we are quite close to that. Uh, it's just in the next slide I will show that. Can I for also explore you know explore Dijkstra and other algorithms? You know pretty you know cool graph. It's very slow. I mean, no, but that's right. okay. Well, I, as I'm sure you'll hear yeah, some yeah, ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I will talk later how to optimize the performance of finding paths. Let's just assume that we have found a lot of paths, like thousands of paths between two entities. So how can we rank them? I don't want to go into the details of the ranking approaches because they are, most of them are, are, are like five or ten years ago. Because in recent works, we didn't see too many advances in this field. But our paper was 2007, same rank paper. In yeah, yeah same rank, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, techniques are, we can, you know, consider the length of a path to some property frequency that occur in the path and the degree century of the entities that appears in the path and also some diversity issues. They are just quite similar to the metrics that we use for the entity summarization, right? So I don't want to go to detail here. Um, let's skip that. And uh, we also have some extrinsic metrics for ranking paths. Uh, we can do, we can use query relevance, and we can use some personalization techniques. For instance, we can directly ask users to weight some, to give different weights to, to classes and relations that the user is interested in. We can also implicitly collect the user's uh, interests by, for instance, we can uh, check their web browsing history to find out which web pages they are interested in so that we can find out their interests. But what, what I'm interested in is how to find out associations between multiple entities, not just two entities, but three or more entities. So here is a, an example of data graph, and we have three entities, EQ1, EQ2, and EQ3 as three query entities. It's in the previous example, we have only two entities. But here we have three entities. How can we define an association between three or more entries in a graph. 
Basically, it has been defined as a size constraint collected subgraph. That is a graph that is connected and also contain all the currencies. So basically, such a graph is usually a tree. Okay. Here is an example. If we define the size by the number of other entities that have to be introduced in order to make the subgraph connected, uh, by introducing two additional entities, we can extract such a subgraph from this graph that connect the three query entities by using two additional entities. So here is an association that connects three query entities we are interested in. And from if we uh, if we allow to introduce two additional query uh, two additional entities, we can actually find three associations from this graph. But in practice, we, we may find thousands of associations, right? It's just a toy example. We can also define it in a different way. That's what we have done uh, in, in our upcoming ISTOPC work. We define as, a, we give a different definition of size. We, we do not use the number of additional entries that can be introduced. We use a diameter of this subgraph because we believe that diameter is a natural extension of the length of a path. The diameter means the, the maximum of the distances between all pairs of nodes in this graph. So again, uh, assume that we, we are interested in all the associations having a diameter of three or less. Then from this graph we can still find out these three examples. There's these three associations that connect these uh, three query entities. And for each of these associations, its diameter is just three or even less. That's a different definition of association. OK. Anyway, uh, the problem is how to efficiently find out such graphs. You, you can see that pass is just a special case of this subgraph, right? If we have two entities, it's a pass. If we have multiple entities, it's a subgraph. Okay. So what we have done to improve the performance of finding such a subgraph is to use the distance information. Let's see this example. Okay, suppose that we want to find out all the uh, associations or subgraphs that have a diameter of of uh, of three or less. Okay, so so the idea is to do n-directional BFS. So we start a BFS from each query entity. So we start a BFS from EQ1, a BFS from EQ2, and a BFS from EQ3. Because we are interested in a path of length three or less, so when we start from EQ1, and when we do when we do BFS, we move to E3. Usually, we can continue to to one one step further, right? But but now in this work, we will just stop here. We will prune the remaining search space, and we can safely prune it. Why? Because at this point, we know that the distance between E3. And EQ2 is actually 4, right? It already exceeds the diameter, the allowed diameter of the subgraph that we are looking for. So that means there won't be any association, there won't be any subgraph that have a diameter of 3 or less and also uh, can connect, connect can, can contain a path from this query entity to this entity. So, so, we, so you already computed the uh, shortest path length? Uh, we, we just assume that we, we, there is a way to obtain the distance between all pairs of nodes in this graph. The shortest path. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. But the thing is, uh, it's really difficult to get distance between all pairs of nodes. We can compute the distance on the fly, but that will, that will be very, very slow. We can also pre-compute it and index and store the distance. But that's also not impossible because you know a graph can have a billion of nodes. And if we want to index the distance between all pairs of them, that will be a square of a billion, quite larger number. It's impossible to, to store the, the pre-computed distance. So what we do in the work is we use a distance oracle. Maybe some of you know that work. Uh, it's actually a different research field. 
about is uh, what is a distance oracle. A distance oracle is a kind of data structure. Uh, it computes something in order to speed up the computation of distances, but it does not compute everything. So it, it achieves a trade-off between time for computing distances and the space for storing distances. What you're saying is it's not all path thing, it's uh, some path thing? Uh, I mean, um, it's actually, uh, so I can give an example of a distance oracle. It tries to compute the distance between all the nodes and some landmark nodes. And, you know, uh, so in that way, we don't need to store the distance between all pairs of nodes in a graph, right? Because we only compute part of the distance. And with those distances between nodes and the landmark nodes, we can more efficiently compute distance between all pairs of nodes. That's one kind, one type of this distance oracle. There are many kinds of distance oracles. That's a, you know, a, a, it's, itself is a popular research problem. And we just uh, use a state-of-the-art work on, on this, in this field, and it works fine. That's how we uh, optimize the performance of finding subgraphs or finding paths in a very large graph. Um, we may find a lot of subgraphs as associated between multiple entities, and we can do some ranking work. So, so let me just summarize. So you're saying that you'll, using a landmark node, you'll find uh, some kind of upper bounds on the length. Uh, is, is that how you kind of limit? Uh, uh, actually, we um, in this work we we just reuse an existing distance oracle. Uh, the idea is to yeah that, that oracle the idea of that oracle is to compute uh, the distance between nodes and some landmark nodes and so with that information the oracle can compute distances more efficiently they are from scratch. Uh, but the details are very complex. Mm -hmm. so. yeah, about it. Okay. Next I will go into some abstract methods. That is, we don't simply just do some ranking. We, we do, do more, more than that. So here, uh, that's what we have done two years ago. Here are two paths, or two associations between two entities. Right? Two paths in the graph. Here is what we call an associated pattern. So these two paths both follow this pattern because second author and first author are sub-properties of author. Paper A and paper B are instances of the paper class. <coughs> and conflict and conflict B are instances of the conflict class. And reviewer and chill are uh, sub-properties of the real property. So we, we will say that these two paths are, uh, they, they follow this associated pattern. And instead of showing top rank associations, I mean top rank paths, we don't show paths. We show path patterns, actually, as a high level abstraction of paths. So, excuse me. Yep. So, that means you made the abstract schema over the existing schema. Yeah, uh, exactly. We, uh, we actually try to infer some schema from the data. Huh? Sorry? That's done manually, not automatically. Yeah. No, no, that's automatically. That's automatic. Automatic, yeah, automatic. Okay. That's for the associates between two entities. So given multiple entities, the idea is similar. We can, so now it's not pass pattern, but a graph pattern. Yeah. So how do we evaluate this kind of a work? Good question. Um, in our, two years ago, in our ICFC work, we did the uh, user study. We implement our approach, and we implemented some other approaches that did not use patterns, and we give some tasks. We, def we, we, we define some, some search tasks to ask users to complete this task by using different systems, and we will see uh, whether users can, can complete the tasks more efficiently by using the patterns, uh, something like that, and we can hand out some questionnaires to collect their opinions about these uh, different systems. That's how we do the evaluation. Okay, so let's go back to here. Uh, yeah, for graphs, the idea is similar. 
we can replace entities with their classes to obtain a graph pattern uh, to, as a high level abstraction of associations between multiple entities. Um, again, we may have a lot of patterns, so we also need to rank patterns. Uh, I guess that's not quite interesting, so I'll just skip. Uh, yeah, I just want to say one, say about one pat, one metric, in uh, frequency here. It's actually quite easy to calculate the frequency of something. We just count, right? But for graphs, counting is not easy. Here are two associations. Uh, we know that uh, Z1 is a pattern of this association X1, right? Because we replace the MC E1 by its type C1, and we replace E4 by its type C2, so we get uh, an association pattern for this association. And similarly, we get this pattern for this association. Actually, these two patterns are the same. They are isomorphic to each other, right? But we don't know that in our programs. In programs, we just have two graphs. We need to determine whether these two graph patterns are, are isomorphic to each other. That's a graph isomorphism problem, which is quite a hard problem. But fortunately, what we deal with here, they're not uh, general graphs. They are, they are usually trees. So there are very efficient algorithms for, for uh, deciding the isomorphism between trees. We can generate some a canonical code for a tree. Uh, based on the canonical code, we can we can know uh, if the two trees have the same canonical code. We will know that they are actually is uh, uh, isomorphic uh, trees. So we will count the frequency as twice, right? Otherwise, we will do a wrong calculation when we compute the frequency. Uh, for the canonical code, I don't want to go into details here because uh, there are some very nice survey papers on this topic. Okay. Finally, I will briefly talk about how to summarize the data set. We have seen some, uh, only a few extractive methods, so I, I will just skip that because that's not a mainstream in this field. Uh, the mainstream is in this field are abstractive methods. First method is called inferred schema, which is very, very popular. You can find a dozen of papers using this approach. The idea is that it's actually we, we just show the schema of this data graph. We use a schema as a summary. That's the idea. But you know, uh, in semantic data like RDF data, RDF is actually schemaless, right? You, we can have the data without any schema. So we need to infer the schema from the data. That's kind of weird, right? So, so for instance, if we know the paper C and the paper, uh, and uh, these are these four entities are papers. So we have a paper class here, and these are two conferences. So we have a conference node here, and we also have two persons. So we have a person class here, and we can aggregate relations into this graph. So we have a, a schema that can be inferred from the data, right? We can use this schema as a summary of this very large graph. So we actually show a conceptual level uh, abstraction of data, right? That's, that, that's called an inferred schema. But you know, the schema can also be very large. So we can try to extract a sub-schema from a schema as a, as a summary. That's basically the state of the art, actually. Uh, a natural extension of this idea is to partition the entities based on different uh, principles. So uh, if we look at such an inferred schema, it actually gives a partition of the entities in the data. It partitions the entities according to their classes. And then in this, uh, in this summary, it connects entity partitions with relations. Right? So what is the summary here? The summary here is actually entity partitions connected by relations. That's an inference scheme. So more generally, we can use different metrics to partition entities. We can partition entities based on their common attributes or their common paths in the graphs. 
there are various ways of partitioning and entries. We don't necessarily uh, need to use their classes. We can partition entries in according to different equivalence uh, relations. So that's what we call the flat partitioning. Um, there are some very nice work in recent uh, Sigma conference about this work. So our work, uh, the idea is slightly different. Uh, it's, that's what I just presented at the GKI this year. We generate not a, a flat partitioning of entities. We generate a hierarchical grouping or hierarchical partitioning of entities. Because flat partitioning has problems. One, the data set is very large. Uh, you know, in a summary, we can show a limited number of groups or entity partitions in a summary, right? So either the groups will represent very highly broad topics, or we need a lot of uh, small groups. So, so flat partitioning has such kind of scalability issues. So we solve it by generating a hierarchical grouping. As you can see in this example, the root of the hierarchy represents all the entries in the data set, and then we divide it into um, uh, several groups, and we can continuously to repeat this division until we have a hierarchy of entries. And each group is identified by a property value pair that is shared by all the entities in this group. And between sibling groups at each level, we can connect these groups by the relations that connect entities in these groups. So here's a, 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 a example summary that we generate for a data set. There, you know, there can be various ways of generating a, a hierarchy. There can be different hierarchies. Which hierarchy is better? We defined five aspects in choosing uh, the groups. Uh, first is coverage of data. Um, we want the groups to cover as many entities in the data set as possible in order to not to lose too much information. So we prefer large groups, but we don't prefer very large groups because if all the groups are very large, the hierarchy will be very high. That means uh, users need a lot of interactions to navigate to the groups that she's interested in. So we actually we, we prefer moderate size subgroups. Third aspect is cohesion within groups. Uh, we hope that uh, entities in a group are cohesive. They're about closely related topics. So we, 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 are, we prefer to find some informative property value pairs to label a group. To label a group. And we, in this approach, we also allow overlap between groups. So in, in all the previous works, uh, you know, they are based on entity partitioning. Partition means groups are not overlapped. Okay, but in this work, we allow different degrees of overlap. Uh, that's the basic idea. And again, we formulate the problem as a computational optimization problem. So generating a, a hierarchy, a hierarchical grouping of entities is, is formulated as a multi-dimensional knapsack problem. Uh, I don't really want to go into details here. The paper is already online, you can check the paper by itself if you're interested. Some group so, so is it all NP hard? And Sorry? So is it all NP hard? Yeah, yeah, yes. So we we have to use some simple heuristics. But the uh, interesting is that if you look at our paper, we have some a very sophisticated algorithm for that greatest strategy because the, the, the data set is very large, so even implementing greatest strategy is not a trivial task. Uh, it requires a lot of uh, what, what, work. What, what, what data sets have you typically used? Uh, it's uh, LinkedMDB, I guess. Maybe LinkedMDB and Symmetric Dog Book, I think. Yeah. To, to, they are not very large data sets, actually. Yeah. But the uh, algorithms are already not very fast. Yeah. So concluding remarks. Okay. So from the research aspect, uh, I think uh, for summer edition for for this research field, we need to define more application scenarios because uh, many of my papers have been rejected because the reviewers believe that we we need some more clear application scenarios. So. We have found three applications, Google's uh, Infobox and 
uh, association finding and uh, data set summarization for open data models, but we still need more applications. And new applications may raise new metrics. We have seen only five or six types of metrics in the leaflet, but there can be more. Um, and again, we, we, we need to do evaluation, so we need to define some benchmarks so that other researchers can you know, quickly get into this community to do their own experiments. In practice, unfortunately, we haven't seen any handy tools that can be used to summarize the metric. We have some text summarized text summarizer available on the map, right? So you can download it and you can summarize a piece of text. But for semantic data summarization, we haven't seen any uh, tools that, are, that can be easily used because every tool, every approach basically requires some, do some indexing or do some pre-computation. So it's not easy to develop such a tool that can be easily used. So that's what we need to do in the near future to give users tools that can be used. Okay. Yeah, here is uh, some, some papers if you are interested in. I will use uh, another five minutes. Yeah. Oh, it's already over time. So if you are interested, I can use five more minutes to introduce our some other work. Um, I'm, I'm passing the, the Gaokao challenge. If, Oh, that challenge yeah. thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And, uh, it's also, uh, I just presented it at Ichikai uh, this week. Um, uh, you know what is Gaokao? Gaokao is uh, China's national higher education entrance examination, it's China's SAT. Uh, but it's more, it's, it is believed to be much, 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 much more difficult than SAT. And it tests everything. Chinese mathematics, English language, history, geography, uh, biology, physics, chemistry, everything. Gaokao is difficult for the computer. Uh, we hope that we can develop a, a software that can pass, uh, can automatically pass Gaokao to enter a top level university in China. That's uh, the goal of this project, very large project. Um, but we found that uh, it's very difficult because the questions in Gaokao are difficult to be understood by the computer. Uh, I think some of you have developed some kind of question answering QA systems, or like uh, Watson or some other systems available. But if we look at the questions that can be handled by the existing QA systems, they are very simple questions. Just one sentence long, right? Asking for a fact. But if we look at the uh, Questions in Gaokao, here is an example, in, in history test in Gaokao. Such a question has multiple sentences. That means we need more sophisticated NLP techniques, like discourse analysis, co-reference resolution, and something else. Right? So it's quite difficult to understand that question. And there are some domain-specific ex expressions in such questions, like quotes in history tests. Such quotes are written in classical Chinese, which is different from the modern Chinese language we use today. It's highly ambiguous and highly compact language. So existing NLP techniques can't, can't even pass that language. And there are also some formulas in maps, and maps in geography. How can we do with that? Finally, you know, in Gaokao, uh, for human students, uh, students have a lot of common sense language, uh, sorry, common sense knowledge, right? But for computer, we don't have that. We have some, but that's not sufficient for answering uh, a question in, in, in a Gaokao level exams, right? So the, the, the knowledge, the, the resources to search for an answer are unspecified and seemingly unbounded. Everything can be tested here. So that's the challenge. So how we, how we try to solve it? We haven't solved it yet, so that, that's the one way to, that we, we are trying. So we try to simulate what a human, a human student would follow to, to, to answer a question in Gaokao. So basically, you know, uh, Chinese students, they, 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 they memorize a lot of facts in their memory, and given a question, they will try to recollect some knowledge that is relevant to the question, and then Students will draw some evidence from the relevant knowledge because some knowledge are not relevant, are not that relevant. We need to do some knowledge filtering to draw some key evidence that may be helpful 
to answer a question, and finally, a human will do some reasoning based on the evidence to so find out the answer to the question. That, that, that's typical uh, path that the student may follow to answer a question. And we do exactly the same, to let the computer do the same thing. In this work, in the preliminary work, we use Wikipedia as our memory, and we, retrie we recollect relevant knowledge by retrieving some pages, some articles from, from Wikipedia that are relevant to this question. And um, then we do some ranking and filtering on these pages because some pages are not truly useful. They are just noise. So we try to filter out some noise pages. And we use the remaining filtered pages as evidence. And based on that pages, uh, we do reasoning. But we don't do logical reasoning. We do textual intelligence. We try to ensure the answer but, by. But sorry. either either logical reasoning or what you call textual entanglement, that may be way too simplistic compared to human yeah. reasoning. Yeah. You might be doing analogical reasoning. You might be, uh, you know, uh, doing uh, even um, guesswork for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. What yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, in this work, we only use text in German, but in our ongoing work, we try to use more sophisticated reasoning techniques. Uh, and, and if you're doing with the text by itself, uh, maybe there is a lot more than that is uh, implicit, not explicitly specified in the text. So how would this reasoning work at all? How would we capture those things? Uh, yeah, actually, in this work, we, we well, when I say reasoning in, in this particular work, I mean we just uh, calculate some similarity between texts as a kind of reasoning. Yeah, yeah, yeah but it's, it's not true reasoning. You're right, but uh, yeah. you know, it, the, what I'm saying is that the text itself may not be complete. It may be inferred in the context of the knowledge somebody already has. Mm -hmm. So you have to identify contextually relevant knowledge, and then you know, and, you know, understand. For example, there may be a term that may be used, and that term it, it has a contextual interpretation that you know when you look at the whole text, but there is no explicit you know, mention of the context. So these kind of things, uh, I don't know how questions can do. Mm -hmm. Maybe the exam questions are more constrained in that sense. No, they, they say that, you know, the example, the question he showed and he See, there, I think the, what I'm missing is what is the word uh, Fiof meant. Yeah. See, if I if I know that that is related to land or population, maybe. No, I but ruled the land and founded seventy one feudal states, and the implication of that uh, feudal state, uh, where the state uh, consists of land, um, and uh, consists of people, that probably is how indirectly it sees the answer, and not any other way. Uh, actually, for for this question, this question just you know, uh, in in China's Gaokao. Uh, uh, students are required to memorize the fact that uh, f uh, the fulfillments are yeah, uh, fulfillment in this dynasty yeah. actually just consists of land and population. So it's kind of yeah. fact. So, so, so See, that's what, so unless yeah. I know that, I, I didn't know that word. Uh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't figure out what's uh, there. Uh, but, but the challenge here in, in this example is it's difficult to understand this question. Yeah, that's a problem here. Yeah, but you know, see, this is the thing where um, this question gave some context. Yeah. Uh, it, it told you about this dynasty, uh, and then you said that um, there is a knowledge somewhere else. They remembered, they memorized mm -hmm. that yeah. this particular thing they had, right? Yeah. So the answer is not in this text by itself, completely, right? Mm -hmm. And even if, if I were to try here, yeah, I have to yeah. make the, you know... See, uh, I, I mean, my... My English knowledge is quite good, but I don't know what that word yeah, is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, no, but I don't think that, 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 I don't think that word is necessary, the necessary word. I'm not sure. No, I'm assuming that that is land and population together, that few of No, plans. no, I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, and, and, and see, uh, I could argue, okay, conceivably, mm -hmm. you see, ruled the land and founded 71 feudal states. And there is a you know, concept of land there, and the states obviously would have concept mm -hmm. of population. And no. the uh, state would not be based on cattle, would not be based on hand plow, would, uh, there is no mention of title here. So no, no, the, way, left is no, the way I did was, I said granted to relatives and invest those relatives with. And so few uh, forfments were mainly granted. So if I know what forfment is, so I would have gone to the dictionary and looked up what that means. Hmm. And I'm assuming that forfment means land and population. So actually, mm, uh, I don't think I'm not sure. I, I don't know. I, I don't know that word. So actually, for this question, for for the computer, the correct answer is uh, we can 
retrieved from Wikipedia that uh, Theophilus can consist in the in the uh, in the Zhou dynasty. Theophilus can just consist of land of population. We yeah, can't see that from the background. It's called computer counter. It's a question, but I guess for 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 students they don't do it that way. Uh, so, so that's why we developed this approach. We first like to do entity linking. Actually, we try to identify the entity mentions in the question and to link them to Wikipedia articles to retrieve a lot of Wikipedia pages. Uh, and then we um, we represent each page as a point in a vector space and try to compute the center of the pages and to identify the noise pages that will be filtered out. Um, and we will use the, the, the remaining uh, central pages as evidence for entailment. And for entailment, uh, we actually we you know we, we, we deal with multiple choice questions. So we the task is to calculate the, to uh, to estimate the truth of each option, right? And we define the truth of a, of an, an option as the extent to which the question itself and the pages retrieved based on an option can collectively entail this option. That's the goal to achieve. And we, de we de de decompose it into two parts. That is the extent to which the pages retrieved from the, the stem of the question can entail the option, and the extent to which the pages retrieved from this option can entail the stem. And the full entailment, we just carefully relevance. I mean, text the similarity in this particular work but we can replace it with more sophisticated textual entailment work in, in future. You might be interested in results. We have tested our approach on real questions in Gaokao. Um, <clears throat> we collected more than 500 questions from Gaokao in okay, history. Only choice questions, right? No other. Yeah, just multiple choice questions. Okay? But 500, more than 500, and we, we ask human students to solve them, okay? But based on only Wikipedia, and we find that only 100, more than 100, can be solved based on only Wikipedia. That is, for the rest of the questions, we need some other resources of knowledge in order to answer it. So, but, so on this, these 123 questions, our approach can correctly answer 43% of all the questions. Even on the questions that are out of scope of Wikipedia, our approach can answer more than 30%. So you know there are four options in each question. So the if we do it, we select an answer randomly. The expected accuracy is twenty five percent. So it's uh, already uh, about the uh, uh, random choice, but still long way to go because with this this score, we can't enter any university in China. I guess. Yeah. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So, um, do you know the work of Michalis uh, Vergitianis? He's in France at the Ecole Polytechnique. So, he was doing text summarization um, using, uh, he was doing a graph of words and then uh, using uh, K core. K core? Yeah. Do, do you don't know that work? I wanted to see. Uh, is text summarization or data yeah, summarization? Yes, I think it's text summarization. Text summarization, okay. Yes. Uh. So I would like to see uh, in the categories you explained to which one it. Uh, uh, Maybe it it's kind of centrality, I guess, because you said uh, he defined some kind of graph over words. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Yeah. It's something like this, I, yeah. So the aim is to. Computes maybe the centrality of a word? Yes, or, yeah. uh, the K core and then. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. I know some work. Actually, um, sorry. Actually, uh, the this uh, centrality idea was inspired from a paper called Lex Rank. I don't know, it's Lex Rank, maybe, maybe it's called Lex Rank. Yeah. It's the idea is to. It's also from borrowed from the uh, text summarization. Mm -hmm. They they represent a, a sentence as a node in a graph and do similar stuff. So we just borrow the idea here, but we found that it doesn't work. Actually, it doesn't work for entity summarization, because in text summarization, we, we are interested in sentences that are central in a document. So that could be good candidates for a summary. Mm -hmm. 
But in, in anti summarization, that's not a thing. So actually, if we look at uh, if we look at uh, such a dis description of one MC, the, the property value pairs, they rarely overlap. They are totally about different aspects. So there is no, no, no central topic here. That's why that work actually does not work. Although we published a paper on it, but we finally found that it doesn't work actually. Yeah. So you're wrong that you do um, on entity summarization will apply also for text summarization? Sorry? No. The work you do for entity summarization uh, will work for text summarization. Uh, so no, no. But basically, we. It's just specific. Yeah, I, I think text summarization yeah. kind of uh, close the field, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's already very developed, so there's not, not too much thing to do in that field. So, in summarizing the data set, also you would use the evaluation, it was similar to the summarization of the association? Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, for the summarization, I can show you some slides from ETI. Uh, if you can see it clearly, um, we 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 don't do we don't involve users in this evaluation because it's hard to define a task here. And we can actually design such an experiment by impl firstly implementing an open, an open data portal by ourselves. And when we equip this data portal with different ways of generating summaries for data set, but that will be a large amount of work to do. You know, we need to develop an open data portal. That's too and much work to do. Also, justifying the tasks. Sorry? Also, justifying the tasks is also a bit Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so in, in this work, we didn't do user study. We just uh, calculate some metrics on the generated summaries. We compare the, the metrics, such as uh, we, we look at uh, the, uh, the percentage of the original data set that can be covered by a summary. And we also calculate the uh, cohesion of the groups that are generated by a summary. So in this way, we can you know, make a comparison between our approach and some baseline work. That's how we do experiments in this work. So what do you think, what will be the challenges if you want to adapt this to a larger graph such as Wikipedia previous? Um, I think scalability is not uh, the biggest issue. The biggest problem is that uh, Dipedia and Freebase cover a wide range of topics. It's technically it's impossible to generate a summary for that kind of data set. So, so all the existing, existing approaches, including ours, are actually specific to, to they are dedicated to the domain specific data sets. Right? So, uh, I don't know how to generate a summary for data, so even from a, as a human being, I don't know how to create such summaries, or I don't know how to tell a computer to do that. Yeah. 